We have learnt in this course that data can be used for several objectives. The first is simply just to learn about your process and understand what is going on. For example, in the section on t-tests, we learnt how to verify whether changes to our process are actually significant or not. We can also learn by observing trends in data visualizations to troubleshoot problems and so forth. In this video, we're going to look at process monitoring, where we build on that topic and take it a step further. Other interesting things that we can do with our data are to build predictive models, such as the least squares model, to make a prediction of a property that's really hard to measure. We've also just recently seen how we can optimize our processes using response surface methods, climbing that mountain and maximizing some value on our process, such as the profit. This last section here considers the fifth major objective, that of process monitoring. Process monitoring is a way that we can track how our system behaves in real time to ensure that it remains on target. Any patterns that we observe in these monitoring plots are then used for troubleshooting. It nicely ties the second and the first objectives together. Let's start with a few monitoring examples that you've seen before. The first is that of a hospital. We've all seen this on TV, where a patient is being monitored for various vital signs, such as heartbeat, blood pressure, oxygen level, blood glucose level, body temperature, these are all parameters that now go into hospital databases to track patients in real time. Perhaps you've seen these monitoring charts in a control room in a chemical plant, or perhaps you've observed stock market charts and people who do intraday trading. In an engineering context, we can monitor our processes for their vital signs to ensure they're behaving on target and away from unsafe operation. When problems are observed in these charts, engineers and operators quickly react to them Notice that process monitoring is a reactive step, it is not proactive. Optimization, which we saw earlier in this course, is a proactive activity. There we proactively moved the process to a better location or operating point. More than any other aspect that we've learned about in this course, this area of monitoring and data acquisition is quickly growing in importance. You may have heard of the terms big data, lean manufacturing, Six Sigma. All of these come out of the topic of process monitoring. If you want to learn more about this area, I strongly suggest reading these good books shown here on the screen for an engineering context. However, I can guarantee this topic will be quite different even five years from now. Let's start off though and look at the workhorse of process monitoring. This is a chart that has been around for almost a century. It's not going to go away. The first feature that you notice is the fact that it is a time series or sequence plot. When new points are added on the right hand side, and previous points get removed or disappear on the left. It is displayed in real time, or as close to real time as possible. The units on the vertical axis are the units of the variable being measured. There might be several horizontal lines also drawn, one of which is the target line. There might also be upper control limits and lower control limits. We'll see how these are derived in the coming videos. I'm going to start with a demonstration though that will quickly illustrate how these are used. Here is an example of an actual system I had the chance to work on. The company was monitoring the appearance of bubbles on the top of a flotation froth. Flotation is a process whereby minerals attach themselves to a bubble, float to the top of the tank and are removed. Air is bubbled into the system and mixed in to assist the process. The company places a digital video camera over the top of the tank and observes the appearance of the bubble. Some examples of these bubble images are now shown here on the screen. One of the parameters the operators are interested in is the bubble size. They are also interested in the bubble's color and other textural features. I'm showing an accelerated version of the two monitoring charts developed for this process. The first is the bubble diameter measured in millimeters and the lower and upper control limits are shown as well as the target value. The second chart monitors the grayscale color which is a scale from zero to 255 and there are also limits for this value. Now at some point in time, the following might take place. We see the bubble diameter has shifted down. The grayscale color has also changed and shifted up. The operator notices the signature of a very particular problem that occurs periodically in the process. When they are alerted to this through an automated alarm process, they know exactly what to do to counteract the problem. Notice, however, the monitoring chart will never conclusively tell you exactly what is wrong with the process. It will simply alert you to the fact that something is wrong. You will have to use your judgment and knowledge of the physical system to do the troubleshooting. 
This is no different to a nurse or a doctor in a medical facility who will have to observe the signals being shown on the medical devices to determine what the problem is, and then make the subsequent diagnosis to fix it. Notice, however, that a variety of different problems can have the same signature on the chart. There is never a one-to-one -one relationship between a problem and its signature on the plot. This is why there is always human intervention required to diagnose and then to fix the problem. This chart that we've just used is called the Schuart chart and named after Walter Schuart from the Bell Telephone Company who developed it in the 1920s to monitor the production of parts at the phone company. It is a chart for monitoring the location of a variable where it lies on the vertical axis. Schuart charts often have a lower and an upper control limit as well as a target line drawn on them. A process is considered to be in control if it lies within those limits. The opposite is a process being out of control when it lies beyond the upper control limit or below the lower control limit. We say that a process is in control when there is variation, but we call that common cause variability within the limits. Regular operation is stable. The product being produced has variability, but it is still sold to the customer as good quality product. When we are out of control, we say that a special cause or special causes have occurred. Some destabilizing event has happened. We are out of control. We are off target. This is product that we typically will not sell to our customer. We may have to modify it or sell it at a lower price or even destroy it. Now one of the toughest problems that engineers face is to figure out which of the many variables available to us should be monitored. Companies have hundreds, if not thousands, of variables available to them, especially on newer plants with multiple sensors. Consider the following situations before we continue on. What would you monitor if you were running a wastewater treatment process? Which variables would you monitor in an oil and gas facility? What might be of interest to track in a food processing unit or a mineral processing plant? Or what if you were producing plastics? Which variables monitor the key quality properties in each of those situations? What about a pharmaceutical facility? How do we know we are producing good quality product in that location? Once you have identified which variable you would like to monitor, we can then go and start constructing a monitoring chart, figuring out what the upper control limit is that we should use, what the lower control limit should be, and what should the target value be. In the process monitoring literature, that step of building the chart, of figuring out those limits and testing the chart on prior operating data is called phase one. This is where you will spend most of your time as an engineer. Phase two is the phase where we go and use this chart on new data that we've never seen before. This is where the operators and the final end users of your chart will spend their time. In the next video, we will look at the phase one construction of a Schuart chart.